Today's seminar is from uh, Neil Gemmell, Professor Neil Gemmell from the University of Otago. Uh, so Neil has been an outstanding member of the genomics community in New Zealand for, for some years. And um, he's going to talk today about uh, some, of the, some of the work, which is, I think from the title looks like it's anchored on his work at Loch Ness, looking for the Loch Ness monster, which was described by one of our advisory boards as the best piece of science communication they'd seen in a very long while. So I'm looking forward to that because I have not actually seen this talk yet. Um, if you wish to sign up for our uh, mailing list, then please send an email to genomics.aotearoa at uh, otago.ac.nz. We'll put you on the mailing list. There are some fantastic seminars uh, coming up. Um, but uh, today, I hope you're all going to enjoy uh, Neil speaking on environmental DNA for biodiversity, biosecurity, and monster hunting. Neil, you good to go? All good. Good. So please uh, mute your microphones, turn off your videos so that everyone can enjoy it. Uh, feel free to bung questions in the chat or we can have spoken questions at the end. Neil, take it away. All right. Well, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Neil Gemmo tōko ingoa. And thanks very much for coming to my lecture. So this is actually, uh, should be a bit of fun, I hope. Um, it certainly has been a lot of fun for me doing the lecture and then talking about it. Uh, and what I want you to get from today is the, this notion that environmental DNA uh, is a very powerful tool to understand our natural world. Uh, and of course, in this instance, we have used um, the power of environmental DNA to see if we could uh, find any evidence of a biological entity in Loch Ness that might explain the monster and the monster myth. Um, but if you like, the science was always about the environmental DNA and the power of that technology. And the monster just happened to be an enormous piece of bait, uh, which turned out to be extremely useful from a science communication point of view. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, let me just quickly introduce some of my work. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a geneticist uh, and increasingly a genomicist. And I and my laboratory have over a large number of years worked using the latest advances in genetics gen genomics to address a variety of questions, effectively uh, in both an ecological and evolutionary context and ranging from sort of you know pure, uh, this would be nice to know type researches, or isn't that fascinating, through to things that actually have direct application. So if I just quickly rush through some of these, um, this is one of my favorites. So we worked on New Caledonian crows, which make tools and off show primate level abilities to solve problems. Um, and we wondered how it was that these crows were smarter than other crows, which as it turns out, all crows are pretty smart and these crows uh, just a little bit smarter and we didn't actually find very much in the way of genomic signature that would explain that fascinating behavior. So that's, that's one of those projects that sounded great and it didn't quite work out as uh, well as we'd like, but we did sequence an awful lot of crow genomes to figure that out. Um, and over on this side of things, uh, this is Styla clava, which is an invasive tunicate uh, or sea squirt species. And this causes huge economic damage all around the world. And we've over more than a decade spent time trying to understand the genetics of this species, uh, where it came from, how it's distributed itself around the world and how it's adapted to new environments. Um, and that continues to be a, a piece of ongoing research in the sort of marine biosecurity space. And I may come back to that because some of these things that we've been interested in for a long time uh, are increasingly tractable uh, in terms of studying using environmental DNA technologies. And I've worked on lots of other things, including uh, sex changing fish and, of course, monsters. And yeah. So here's the challenge uh, for today, really, is to think about ways in which we can use these new technologies to monitor our world in new and exciting ways. So the analogy I like to use here is from All Greaves of Innocence uh, by William Blake. And in that, uh, he challenges us, uh, the reader, to see a world in a grain of sand, you know, to imagine the possibilities that are present within these microcosms that we don't necessarily uh, or couldn't fully resolve. And I don't know about a grain of sand, but I can tell you that a drop of water contains a phenomenal amount of information about the organisms that are present in it, whether it be uh, in a fresh water system, it could be everything from the uh, plants and animals that reside within that river or lake system, through to all the things that are actually adjacent to it and their DNA is constantly being washed into it. So if you like, it's like a giant collecting bowl uh, of, of environmental DNA, which could be a useful way of understanding the broader natural world. And I'm going to explain that as we go through with the um, Loch Ness 
project because some of those findings that we made uh, really do harken back to this notion that it's a giant uh, collecting bowl. So some of you were, or I knew some of you when this project started, um, and it's useful to think about how projects start because sometimes you have to uh, embrace the power of serendipity. So the Loch Ness project started literally in 2016, and it started after I'd been introduced on social media. So I think I'd been on Twitter for about a year by that stage. And I was introduced to a chap called Darren Nash, who writes popular science books, and he happens to be a paleontologist. And we were introduced by a mutual friend. And um, I'd noticed on Darren's profile that uh, he had written a book called Hunting Monsters. And at that time, uh, I just innocently asked, because we've been using environmental DNA for a while, had anyone considered doing an environmental DNA project on Loch Ness? Because, you know, if there was a monster and it was a biological entity, then the rationale would be that it would leave behind some sort of signature of its passing in that environment and we might be able to detect it. And he said, well, no, I don't think anyone's proposed that. Uh, and he gave me a couple of names to check out. And like many ideas that I have, I thought it was extremely brilliant, but I put it off to uh, another day because I had other things that I needed to do. And I thought, oh, you know, it's interesting. It'll be fun, uh, but, you know, probably somebody else will do it or, you know, it'll be done. Anyway, fast forward about six months, maybe seven or eight, actually. And I got a call uh, or an email from a reporter in the United Kingdom who'd said that he'd seen me, uh, this interaction, this Twitter interaction between um, Darren Nation and myself. And uh, he wondered if we'd ever done the project. And I said, no, we hadn't, but I still thought it was quite a good idea. And so, you know, a couple of emails later, and it's like, oh, could you explain how this would work? Because I think my readers would be interested in. And so, yeah, it was, you know, a half an hour's work to type out um, a response saying, well, this is what we would do. So we'd go looking for environmental DNA in Loch Ness. And if it's a biological entity, uh, you know, it might be part, uh, signatures of its, uh, of its passing within the water. And here are some hypotheses that we could test, you know, around the idea of giant uh, Jurassic reptiles through to various giant fish that uh, have been used as explanations for Loch Ness. Um, and of course, we could use other locks where there supposedly is no monster. Uh, as controls, but have similar ecology to Loch Ness and look to see if there's anything different there. So a, a strongly comparative approach. And so um, that's pretty much what I said. And uh, he wrote that up. And then the next thing, I woke up the next morning and um, I had a gazillion emails and uh, tons of phone messages because this thing that had been written up in a local Edinburgh newspaper had uh, gone across the press wire and had been picked up globally. Um, we will have seen a project that was picked up globally for all the wrong reasons relatively recently, but uh, this was good. So anyway, I'm sitting there thinking, um, what should I do? Uh, how should I respond? Because at this stage, I had this inordinate level of press interest for a piece of research that I hadn't done. I mean, hadn't really even fully scoped it or planned it, to be honest. I just thought it was a good idea and we'd explained how you might do it. But here was this phenomenal level of interest uh, based on this tweet. So the tweet went out and then this happened um, and you know there was media interest from around the world. Uh, and so um, I was sitting there thinking, well, what should I do? And then I got another interesting phone call and the phone call was from seven days. So I knew I'd reached peak you know, sort of New Zealand popularity because next thing I know on Friday night, I've been invited to the seven day studio, couldn't make it. I was head of Department of Anatomy at the time and I had other commitments. But then I've got Dave Dobbin singing a song about me. And I guess if we had time, I could play that. We might come back to that later. Um, but uh, that was a bit of fun uh, to have that level of uh, popularization. And I guess I could have left it all there. Oh, hang on, I don't want that. I could have left it all there. I could have left it as you know, Otago scientist plans to identify the Loch Ness monster using environmental DNA and, and, and said, well, that's a great idea, but you know, probably not for me. Let's let somebody else to do it. But I didn't, and here's why. So um, when this broke, which is in 2017, my son was nine years old and I was dropping him off at his local school. And, uh, you know, I was um, surrounded by, not, this is not me, by the way, this is the principal of the school, but, uh, I was surrounded by all his classmates uh, who were coming up and were saying things like, oh, Callan's dad, we, we saw you in the local newspaper, we saw you on TV. Because I decided to at least have a conversation about this initially. Um, and I, 
And if you any of you saw those early interviews, it was quite cautious. We might do this. This is how we would do it. Um, and it was really at that moment I thought, well, actually, you know, why not? We could do this and we should do this. Because these kids were so excited about this idea. So I asked a couple of them, you know, what they thought. They said, oh, we think it's the coolest thing ever. And I, you know, as a, as a scientist, uh, you don't often get that, do you? Uh, this is the coolest thing ever. That's really exciting. Uh, and I thought, gee, if we could just tap into this. Uh, and for two or three of these children, this class of 30, if, if they now see science as a viable career prospect, something that they really want to do, then that could actually be among the more profound things that I could do in my career. If we multiply that across the, the, the country and the globe. So I decided that, what the hell? Um, let's do this. Um, and so we started the process of building a team. And that process took some time. Uh, so the, the very first thing you needed to do was to find a Loch Ness monster expert that you felt you could trust uh, and that you could work with. Because um, let's be honest, when you think about people that uh, make a living out of this, um, you might think that perhaps they are perhaps not um, the most uh, rational of people. Um, and just so you're, we're very clear, I don't believe that there is a monster. But I, as a scientist, I always took the view that we should um, take an open mind and see where the evidence uh, pointed us. So I assembled a team. Uh, and the first person I called was this guy called Adrian Shy. Um, so Adrian's fabulous. I mean, he's just a, a real caricature of, of, of the Loch Ness Hunter. So he's got this full flowing beard and he wears the tweed outfit. And he's, you know, it's sort of like, you know, David Attenborough always wears that sort of khaki outfit and um, Adrian always wears a tweed suit. Um, but it, when I was speaking to him, it was very clear that we had a similar view to how this project could go. So he had been looking for the monster since the 1970s. And I'll tell you about some of his activities shortly. But what we shared in common was that neither of us were particularly convinced that there was a monster out there, but we realized that Loch Ness presented a phenomenal opportunity to talk about science to the general public. And he's been doing this for years and he's got a, a wonderful uh, exhibition uh, in Drum the Drock at Scotland. Uh, and if any of you have been, um, you know, it's, it's pretty uh, factual. There's lots of information there. And then at the end, they say, well, what do you think? And I think that's not a bad way to to go. And I assembled a team of uh, people who were expert in environmental DNA, including people like Pierre Tabelet, who basically invented environmental DNA, Tom Gilbert, who's one of the leading uh, researchers in ancient DNA and environmental DNA, and Beth Shapiro, um, likewise similarly gifted in that space. And we've got some really good computational people like Stephen Salzberg, uh, who wrote the program Kraken, which is particularly powerful for analyzing these kinds of data. And then we uh, worked with a variety of people in the UK who also supported the project, um, people from the University of Highlands and Ireland's and Inverness uh, who joined the project because they had a major project uh, looking at um, lake and lock quality through the Highlands and uh, northern parts of, of, of Great Britain. Um, and so, you know, adding Loch Ness into this project was a natural thing for them to do, but they hadn't tackled it because it's the UK's biggest lake. And so why would you tackle the biggest lake, which is going to require a lot of time and effort and resource when you could work on smaller lakes that would take less time and effort, but probably deliver the same sorts of information. But naturally, as soon as we said we were about to do this big sampling on Loch Ness, they were like, oh, yes, we could be involved with that too. We'd love to be involved. And we had some very talented people locally, particularly uh, Jan Yunan, who at the time had just finished his PhD with me, uh, and uh, I convinced him to come to Loch Ness. Uh, and, and help out. So Loch Ness, uh, for those of you who haven't been there, is big uh, and it's deep and it's dark and it's pretty mysterious. To give you a local context, it's probably about the size of Lake Wakatipu. It's actually not quite as deep as Lake Wakatipu or as long, uh, but um, roughly sim not that dissimilar in terms of size and scale. So it's about 40 kilometers long. It's about 227 meters deep at two of its deepest points, one in the north in basin as it's called and one in the south and it holds roughly 8 billion cubic meters of water and apparently I'm told that's as much water as is found in all of uh, England and Wales combined so it is by far and away uh, the UK's largest lake by volume and I know those of you who have Northern Ireland Irish connections would probably tell me but no the other one I can't remember what it's called um, 
look low or something, which is bigger in terms of surface area. This is bigger in volume. And it's deep and it's dark and it's mysterious. So it has a mirror-like uh, surface. Uh, the water is a sort of a straw color. So it contains lots of tannins and they act as polarizing filters. They block out the light. And if you're nine meters down in Loch Ness, it is pitch black. Um, so you're losing light very quickly and you're going from a photo, uh, photo um, synthetic driven uh, ecology to a chemically driven ecology in the bottom. So there's quite a lot of uh, interesting organisms that are present and there's methane seeps and unusual bacteria that occur down there and there's salinity differences and a whole swag of other things. So actually as pieces of water go, it's, it's pretty interesting from a biological point of view. But it is also, it is claimed, home to a monster. And this, uh, this monster uh, has been sighted more than a thousand times uh, since the sixth century uh, with St. Columba supposedly uh, rescuing a pilgrim at a fjord uh, from a monster that was about to eat him, uh, you know, doing the sign of the cross and saying, you know, out damned um, serpent or whatever. Uh, of course, that uh, rendition of that story was actually written down about 100 years later. So who knows exactly what happened, but that's the, the myth. And then for about, well, I don't know, 13 centuries, there wasn't very much re uh, related to uh, monsters and monster myths around Loch Ness that is recorded. And it really all started um, to fire off in about 1933, when a couple called the Spices were driving along the relatively recently installed road along the side of Loch Ness, uh, back to their home after watching a movie in Inverness, which as it happens was King Kong. And if you recall the 1933 version of King Kong, Kong uh, fights uh, a dinosaur uh, and is victorious. But uh, having watched um, some pretty bad stop motion um, animation, uh, the Spices were very well primed to the idea that when something ran across their road that night, that it may have been a dinosaur. And that's indeed what they reported. And this myth has persisted ever since. And so more than a million people uh, a year uh, in pre-COVID would go to Loch Ness to see if they could see the monster. And there are large numbers of people who sit at home in their armchairs or on their sofas, checking out Google Earth to again, see if they can find any evidence of the monster. Now, the most famous uh, monster image perhaps is this one. So it's a so-called surgeon's photograph, which was taken in 1934. The history behind this is quite interesting. So it's complete fake and forgery, at least according to deathbed confessions. And it arises because in 1933, a guy called Marmaduke Witherall was a big game hunter, was hired by the Daily Mirror to go up to Loch Ness and investigate the Spice's sightings. And he didn't actually find anything. So he looked around the loch and didn't find anything. So he perpetrated a relatively basic hoax. So he had a hippopotamus ashtray that he had collected during his time in Africa. And he made footprints all around the edge of the lock, took photographs of those and sent that to the Daily Mirror who duly reported it. Um, castings were made of this footprint and it was sent to the British Museum. And they took about 30 seconds to proclaim that it was indeed a hippopotamus foot. And it was the most unusual hippopotamus they had ever sighted because it only seemed to have one left foot, um, forefoot in fact. Uh, and so this was a, if it was a hippopotamus, it had one leg and it had been hopping around the edge of the lock, which seems unlikely. Anyway, poor old Marmaduke Weatherall, uh, his reputation was somewhat tarnished by that. And so uh, over time, he uh, concocted what is perhaps the most elaborate and uh, long-standing hoax at Loch Ness. So he managed to get a friend of a friend to concoct a uh, artificial uh, monster and the artificial monster was this. So it was a, where is it? Why hasn't it not come up? There it is. It was a toy submarine uh, with a plasticine uh, head. Now, real monster hunters get quite hot under the collar here because they say that plasticine wasn't invented in 1934, so this can't be true. But let's just assume it was some form of modeling clay, which did exist. And they perpetrated this and they got a credible person, uh, a surgeon, 
to take the photograph and then uh, purport this. And the argument goes that this uh, was is, is the iconic photo, and it was only overturned in about um, early 2000s, uh, excuse me, based on a deathbed confession. Nevertheless, there are numerous um, sightings every year of so-called monsters. Um, this is one from 1997, uh, which is a video recording uh, taken, and there's, you can see a torpedo-shaped like object moving through here. This is a boat wake, but it looks like a giant sort of Leviathan-y type shark, if you want to believe that. This is perhaps the most famous. Uh, so this is from Scott and Ryan's exhibition, uh, exhi yeah, exhibition um, in uh, expedition, sorry, is the word I'm looking for, expedition in, in the late 1960s. And they published this in Nature in 1975, these images showing what they claimed was a plesiosaur-like uh, a body with a long plesiosaur-like neck, neck, and this is supposedly its foreflipper, and they called that Nesoterasis uh, rhomboterix, um, which basically means Nessie with a rhomboid-shaped flipper. Um, Ryan's, uh, if you ever look him up on video, is quite extraordinary. So he claims they'd found basically the eighth wonder of the world or seventh wonder of the world, and that uh, the British government should declare Loch Ness a world heritage site and place of special scientific interest because of this creature. Um, one of you or some of you may recall that when I was doing this work that uh, the critic was indeed quite critical of my work and suggested that we were wasting a lot of taxpayers money on something which wasn't very uh, worthwhile. And they made the grandiose claim at the time that no um, reputable university would endorse such a project. Um, I just wanted to point out that Ryan's was affiliated with both Harvard and MIT and uh, had some of the world leading sonar experts on his expedition. They were showing off and showcasing the leading technology of the day. And in many ways, our project has followed suit. So I had no real shame there, but what I was uh, concerned of when I saw Ryan's is that uh, his, he, he leapt to conclusions which I thought were uh, way too premature and made claims that were way too grandiose. So I had a, a very uh, high bar that I could easily keep under uh, to avoid being seen as being a little bit too foaming at the mouth about our findings. Um, occasionally people see do things that are a bit weird. So here's three humps in Loch Ness. This is actually three gray seals swimming in synchrony. This apparently is the first late night or nighttime observation of the Loch Ness monster e ever. Uh, there's a little black dot somewhere in here uh, which is probably a bird. Uh, this one was taken literally two weeks before we turned up at Loch Ness in June 2018. Uh, and this was taken by an Irishman who literally stood in the same position for 10 minutes video recording this blob moving backwards and forwards. Now, this always makes me suspicious because if it was me and I was an observer and I was recording something, I'd be quite happy if I got 30 seconds of good footage like that. And then my natural instinct would be to try to get closer and get a much better picture but um, that's not what he did and so I probably would have to put that one down in the likely to be a hoax category. Um, I've already said this but I want to reiterate it so over the years people have looked and looked for the Loch Ness Monster and nobody's found any convincing evidence and everybody has brought the leading technologies of the day to the question and if you like Loch Ness is a great system in which to test those technologies and see how they work so Back in the early 60s, there was um, uh, high-speed cameras that were used, uh, and there were thousands and thousands of uh, feet of film taken and processed, and uh, presumably in an archive somewhere, uh, of, of, of uh, supposed monsters and monster sightings. People have used submarines. I would have loved to have used a submarine, but I didn't have the budget for one. Um, this submarine uh, is from the 19, late 1960s. Uh, it has a, a harpoon on it to take a uh, organic biopsy of the Loch Ness Monster, uh, which I believe was never, never achieved. But if you go to the exhibition, uh, then they tell you that these scratches on the hull are because it uh, encountered the monster. Uh, this is my friend Adrian Shine. He made himself into a human bait ball. So he had a, a small home-built submersible, and then he sort of crouched up yogi, uh, yogi style in there. Uh, and then hung lumps of meat on the outside in the hopes of um, attracting the monster. Curiously, about 30 years later, um, what was his name? 
and having one of those moments. Doesn't matter. Just forgotten. One of those Hollywood actors who got into trouble. So it could be any number of them. It'll come back to me. Uh, curiously, I said to Rage, and what would happen if this block this monster had been real and had attacked you? And he said, well, that was a fair point, and he didn't actually really have a strong contingency exit, but he had a little escape hatch out the bottom here. Um, he smartened up uh, about uh, the late um, mid-1980s, and I remember this quite vividly. He, he did a project called Operation Deep Scan, where he had boats with side-scanning sonar going up and down the lock and looking for evidence of the Loch Ness monster or or, or detections that um, would be detected by multiple different boats. So often when you're doing sonar observations, you get false blips, um, echoes or reflections off of uh, surfaces. And it's only when you can contrive angulate across multiple uh, uh, independent observations that you would tend to believe things. Uh, and then in the, about four years ago, a Japanese submersible literally went underwater for literally weeks recording every single feature within Loch Ness and didn't find a monster. So armed with this uh, relatively long history of disappointment, uh, anything that we would find would be interesting. So what we were trying to do was to just find out what lived in Loch Ness, what were the creatures and uh, that were present. And mostly we were thinking we would describe the fish and uh, plant life and other biodiversity might be present in Loch Ness. And of course, we might find evidence of something that might explain the monster and the monster myth. That was, if you like, the bait on the relatively uh, dull science hook. So how does environmental DNA work? Well, so those of you who have been to Mike Bunce's talk in the same session probably know this relatively well. But the, the basic premise is that all organisms, as they move through their environment, uh, leaving behind signatures of their passing, whether it be uh, for people, for ourselves, you know, we're sloughing off skin, we're losing eyelashes, eyebrows, hair. Uh, and so there is this constant signature, or genetic signature of our passing that we've left behind. And those of you who may have watched the movie Gattaca will recall that uh, when they thought there was somebody who shouldn't be there, they went in there with their sort of vacuum cleaners they sucked up all the detritus and then they sequenced it. And we're not very far away from being in a position where those sorts of technologies are actually real. Um, we probably won't get whole genomes from them, but we're certainly going to get quite a lot of uh, shotgun uh, genomic data or metagenomic data from them. Uh, and of course, in the marine environment and freshwater environments, organisms are uh, losing uh, scales. Uh, if they're fish, they're shedding mucus, they're peeing, they're pooing into the water. Uh, in some instances, the very small organisms are small enough to actually be sampled as part of the sampling process. And so we're getting this organic potpourri of, of, of material uh, that we're collecting effectively with a molecular net. Uh, just as if you were scooping through a pond with a, a fishing net and you collect a, a large number of different organisms that way, uh, we are collecting the same thing, but it's mostly cells and DNA and RNA. So we take those water samples, we process them uh, through our molecular filters, we enrich and extract uh, the cellular material and uh, get the DNA out of it, and then we sequence that using um, fairly standard next generation sequencing technologies. And for most of the work that we do, we do a process called metabarcoding, where we're using primer pairs that are going to make multiple copies of target sequences within um, our sample. And we, in this case, used uh, five different primer sets, which covered everything from uh, plants through to vertebrate organisms. And then once we've got that sequence information, then we're going to use standard bioinformatic uh, tools to make computational matches against databases and extract a, a list, if you like, a shopping list of species that are present. And before we'd even got to Loch Ness, we knew that environmental DNA worked. So Kurt Jan had uh, basically finished his PhD showing this technology was indeed as good as we, um, in fact, actually better than we thought it might be. So when Herat Yarn and I first started working in environmental DNA in about 2013, 14, somewhere in that ballpark, um, we were highly dubious that an environmental DNA signature in a, thing, in a place as vast as our oceans would actually give us useful information. 
So the first thing we really want to know, know is how spatially discrete was it and, and how reliable was it? So we did some experiments out at Aramoana and Dunedin uh, across a number of different habitat types. So we had some sandy beaches and we had some rocky shores. Um, we also had some transect out into the open water. Uh, and then we also had some samples around mudflats. And so within a space of about a kilometre, kilometre and a half, we had very, very different environments uh, spanning um, relatively short distances. And of course, the simple question you would ask is, if I'm taking a sample at Sandy Beach 1, is that going to be the same as Sandy Beach 2? And are the rocky areas different from the sandy beaches? You know, what does the species distributions look like? Because when we go diving in those localities, you know, the species that we observe are quite different. And fortunately, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly, because, you know, you've got tidal actions, you've got wave actions, you th th would think there'd be a lot of mixing. Uh, these signatures are incredibly discrete and they're reproducible. So sandy beach areas uh, tend to show the sorts of species that you'd expect to find in sandy beaches. So when we go out and we look, we find that, you know, we find things like moki and terakihi and cod and other species around those rocky areas. In the sandy areas, we find things like flatfish, flounder, that sort of thing. Um, and when we go into the open oceans, we find evidence of species that we don't find in either of those environments like um, seven gill sharks. So even at that stage, we were thinking that this technology uh, showed the spatially discrete pattern and therefore we might be able to use it quite effectively in Loch Ness. And the other thing that's important to note about this is that uh, this is not a long-term signature. Normally, it depends on water temperature and productivity, but normally we are seeing a signature of organisms retained within an environment roughly up to three days after their passing, perhaps even a week if it's really cold. And Loch Ness is really cold. So using eDNA to find a monster, this is an exciting bit. Um, so we went there in June 2018, and we had a really cool team of people. We went around the lock and collected water samples at a variety of different locations. So this map here just shows you Loch Ness, and each one of these dots is a sample that we've taken. And just to orientate you, this is Loch Ness up here, just south of Inverness. Uh, so Loch Ness is connected to uh, the North Sea, um, is it? Yes. Uh, by the Moray Firth. Um, so uh, by, it's only about six miles long. And so what we've got here, all these blue samples represent sort of samples around the edge of Loch Ness at the surface. And then all these samples through the middle here, the colored, uh, orange colored dots, they are samples that were taken at depth. And so we took samples at the surface at 50 meters, 100 meters, and as deep as 200 meters down. And we took about 260 samples. Oh no, can't count. 238. Uh, so there's only 202 samples from Loch Ness itself, and there's 36 samples from five nearby locks. So these are some of the nearby locks, uh, which presumably don't have monsters. This one does. That's what the myth is. And I just want to acknowledge the Loch Ness project uh, and exhibition who uh, donated to us a boat time and a skipper. So this boat will take you out uh, for a fee to look for the monster each day. They have daily cruises, but they stop at 6 p.m. And so we were doing all our work after their normal work day. Um, but fortunately, at this time of year in the Highlands, it was light till about 11 o'clock at night. So uh, it, was, it was pretty good. Um, one small problem uh, with respect to our control locks is that Scotland has a bit of a monster problem now. Um, so obviously you've heard of Nessie, but you may not have heard of Weeoiki, uh, which uh, lies directly to the south, or, or Lizzie, or Morag, or Sheila. Um, but it turns out that whether, whether it's by history or by the fact that everybody saw how uh, effective a tourism uh, trap uh, the Loch Ness idea was, uh, Scotland now has quite a proliferation of monsters. So I can't guarantee 100% that the um, control locks uh, did indeed have no monster. So how does one then go looking for a monster? What might we find? And what might we expect? Um, 
Well, we're starting from a hypothesis driven point of view. So we decided to test some of the leading hypotheses that have been put forward to explain, excuse me, the monster and the monster myth. And it's a relatively simple idea, really. We go looking into our DNA sequences and then we ask the question, where on the tree of life do we get direct hits uh, from those sequences? Um, and you could say quite reasonably, but Neil, you don't know what a plesiosaur sequence looks like. And I would say, yes, it's true, but we could probably reconstruct that ancestral state. But bear with me, that really doesn't matter. So here's the leading hypothesis that we tested, this idea that there's a plesiosaur or a Jurassic Age reptile, or in fact, any, any kind of giant reptile in Loch Ness. Um, we went looking for this, the giant whale's catfish. So this occurs in mainland Europe. It can grow to about five meters in length, but genuine, genuinely is a monster. This one was caught in the Po River in Italy. Uh, this is a pigno sturgeon. This one's actually from Canada, but sturgeon obviously occurs throughout Europe and occasionally are found in English and Scottish waters. Uh, and this is a snake-necked uh, eel. This eel actually is on a beach in Sydney. Um, it's not as large or uh, as scary as it looks, but it is about seven or eight feet long. So these are ideas that had been put forward, not by us, but by others over a period of many years. So what did we have? Well, back when we did this project, which is uh, close to three years ago now, um, we collected 500 million DNA sequences that covered the tree of life. And from the analysis of the meta barcodes that we have, there are approximately 3,000 species or operational taxonomic units, if you really want to get technical, uh, that we've identified from these data. All right. Uh, so as you go looking through these sequences, and we did this with some. No small's okay. All right. Yes, it was Charlie Sheen. You're quite right, Pat Young. Um, thank you. Four and um, half, four or five. Yeah. Sorry, I'm uh, not sh sure. I can hear quite uh, a lot of chatter. Is there a problem? Hurts. Can uh, you just mute your microphones? Yeah. We're having a bit of uh, mm -hmm. noise coming through. What are the other options? Uh, All right. It's sort of like when students are texting on their phones in your lectures, if they come. Um, so just moving on then, folks. Uh, so we find no evidence for plesiosaur okay. DNA or indeed any reptilian DNA sequences in our initial search. Um, and that's been confirmed now by three or four independent laboratories. And so one thing I have forgotten to mention is that we did have quite a big team of people who were doing the analyses on these data. And each of those did those analyses blind of where the samples had came from or what they represented. So what we were trying to do was triangulate uh, across um, the results of multiple independent uh, teams. So no reptilian DNA at all. So it doesn't really matter if it's a plesiosaur sequence in there. It's just nothing that maps anywhere near the reptilian part of the tree of life. Noting, of course, that uh, for bacteria and many other species, it's not a tree. Um, we find no evidence of giant catfish or sturgeon DNA sequences in that search either, which is a shame. Um, but we do find an awful lot of eel DNA. And of course, so the, here's the thing. This means that we can't refute that as a hypothesis, but it also doesn't mean that we can support the idea that a giant eel is indeed the Loch Ness monster. But what, so the way we phrased this, and perhaps it was a little bit cheeky, was that we couldn't uh, refute that popular hypothesis that Nessie might be a giant eel. And this is an idea that was put forward some uh, decades ago that perhaps Nessie was a eunuch eel, an eel that had foregone reproduction and had stayed in the lock and had reached gigantic size. There is some anecdotal evidence to support this, um, as there is for most things. There are Canadian tourists who claim they've seen giant eels. There are observers at Loch Ness who claim they've seen giant eels. There is a power station on Loch Ness in a place called Foyers that's on the eastern side of Loch Ness. Um, and at Foyers, they had uh, uh, an aluminium smelter uh, that this power station powered. Sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Um, and occasionally that power station would stop functioning because, quote unquote, it got chocked full of eels, giant eels, as thick as your leg, as reported in the Courier, I think, which was the local paper um, of the day. And that, uh, not, but sadly, no scientific specimens, no tissue specimens, and no. Um, 
uh, <laughs> no photographic evidence to support that claim. Okay, so no evidence of monsters. So what did we find? Well, um, this was quite reassuring. So all the fish species that we knew were in Loch Ness, and actually there aren't a heck of a lot of them, there's about 13 uh, known species to occur in Loch Ness, including salmon and pike and Arctic char and sticklebacks, we found in our data. And we found a large number of the bird species and other species that we would have expected to find. Um, so that was quite reassuring. We also found an awful lot of terrestrial input into Loch Ness, uh, including things like deer and pheasants and voles. Um, so this is a, it's kind of gross, but this is what that trout's been eating. Um, and a large number of other things. And this is not a new idea, probably for the last five or six years, we've known that these large waterways will get significant terrestrial input. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Animals come down to drink or bathe in the water, they fly over it, they poop in it. Um, what have you. So you're going to get those terrestrial inputs. And indeed, just after major rainfall events, uh, there's a significant uh, influx of terrestrial environmental DNA signatures. I'll come back to that because that is a phenomenal opportunity to study um, our natural world uh, in even um, cooler and new ways. Um, we also went looking for this species. This is pink salmon, which is now an invasive species throughout uh, Europe. So pink salmon actually originate in the Pacific and they, were, uh, they have self-populated um, from uh, the White Sea in Russia where they were uh, raised as an aquaculture species. And they have then moved around Scandinavia and now down into the highlands in Scotland and further. Uh, they are a slightly odd species and they only uh, reproduce every two years. So you get quite strong genetic structure. So they were seen in 2017, but we didn't find any evidence of them in 2018 because it was an odd number, uh, uh, an even numbered year. And if they're spawning every two years, you'd expect to see them in 2019 and then again, 2021, which is uh, apparently there's, um, they're, they're very large numbers being caught this year. Um, but we did go looking for those just in case uh, there was any evidence they might have been uh, populations breeding that year, but we didn't find them. We did find uh, an awful lot of small things that I don't really understand, I'll be honest. So they include things like bacteria, protists, diatoms, rotifers, nematodes and crustaceans. Um, a huge level of diversity, particularly uh, uh, of, of species that are not well described. Um, and so there's quite a lot of information on those. Um, Eddie Dow, who was in that part of our team, uh, made a really nice interactive map so you could go looking for Nessie. Um, on our website, which currently isn't operational because um, it was costing quite a lot of money to keep it maintained. But this shiny app uh, was a really nice way to visualize the data. You could go looking for pie, you could go looking for salmon or eels, or what have you. I'm often asked, did our project kill the idea of a Loch Ness monster? And the short answer is no, uh, I don't think it did. I mean, it probably disappointed a lot of people, um, but uh, it didn't kill the myth. I mean, not a single study that has been undertaken at Loch Ness has found definitive evidence of the monster. Some have claimed to have found more than they actually did. Uh, so the, the myth will persist because people want to believe there are monsters, as Adrian put it. Um, this was uh, run in the mirror. This is, as I think I've said before, this is three gray seals. So one, two, three gray seals in a row. Is this a Loch Ness monster? Uh, yes. Now, not sure how many people are trolling the Daily Mirror on that one, but um, I suspect a fair number of them truly believe. But let's get sort of to the, the, the sort of final sort of thrust of this. Um, I wasn't worried about whether we found a monster or not, because what we managed to do and what we have done is to showcase how powerful environmental DNA is as a tool to uh, understand our natural world. So. What I think is particularly exciting about environmental DNA is its power for monitoring biodiversity, finding invasive species, and potentially operating as some form of early warning system, whether it be for disease carrying organisms or other things that are unwanted in our environment. And this is a threat theme that we've been pursuing in my laboratory now for some years. So let's go back to William Blake and his world in a grain of sand analogy. 
what can we find in fresh water or marine water samples that is useful to us in our mission of protecting uh, the biodiversity of Aotearoa New Zealand? And I think the answer is lots. So we've already got projects underway just to see whether or not we can detect any evidence in environmental DNA samples, whether it be soil or water, of species that are currently endangered. So Lara Urban, working with the Department of Conservation, has been looking to see around Fiordland uh, whether there are any uh, signals of takahe or kakapo uh, present in water samples that have been taken in places like Doubtful Sound, which, if you like, is a massive uh, collector of uh, water uh, because it effectively covers the uh, drainage of Lake Manapuri and beyond. We've also been looking for the southern kokako uh, and, and other endangered species, and who knows what we might find. We could go looking for New Zealand's uh, endemic native frogs, which are rare and we don't know very much about them, to be fair, um, and, and see if we can find new populations of those. And we can also look for these things, which sadly are far too abundant in our natural systems, possums, rats and stoats. And in particular, we can look to see whether there are, is evidence of new incursions in areas which we have eradicated recently. Or we can look to see whether uh, what the densities and numbers of animals might be in some areas so that we can better apply our population suppression tools. Other things that I think could be really neat to think about is how we can use this in other contexts to monitor quality of our water, which we know is a major problem, uh, to monitor quality of uh, traditional kai that people would want to eat, but they want to eat it in a sustainable fashion. So this handful of whitebait uh, is probably fine to eat if it's all um, uh, uh, Galaxus exulans, which is the classic inunga. But if it includes things like short-jawed kokapu or some of those other species, which are pretty endangered, um, then that seems like a really bad idea to me. And perhaps we would be able to get to the situation where fisher people could actually do those tests in reasonably real time and decide whether or not to keep their white bait catch or not. I'm worried about the increase in sea surface temperatures that we see around our country. And this has been an ongoing trend now for a number of years and what that is doing to the distributions of species. And we literally have almost next to no idea about what's going on. And of course, uh, this past year and a half or more has taught us the lessons of being able to survey our environment for pathogens that affect us, but also potentially uh, our livestock and other productive systems. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had very early warning of some of these dangers before they get established? Um, and this is a slight aside, but it relates to our environmental DNA work. So this is work that Heath Jan and I were involved in. It's led by a Danish group, and it was looking at antimicrobial resistance of um, uh, bacterial and other bacterial organisms in sewage around the globe. So here's Dunedin here. And we have very low levels of antimicrobial resistance in our sewage in comparison to the rest of the world. But that capability then led us into a slightly different uh, conversation, uh, which we've uh, assisted with, but not really done very much on, to be fair, uh, about the idea of using uh, sewage as a testing measure for COVID. And so we've collected large numbers of samples over uh, the better part of a year to monitor uh, COVID levels in the sewage around Dunedin. And of course, ESR have now taken that on. Um, conscious that I have now spoken for a while, so I'll just wrap this up. Um, here's some stuff that we're currently doing. So this is uh, work that we do in conjunction with the Cawthorn uh, Institute uh, and the Marine Biosecurity Toolbox um, around how we can actually improve the way to do environmental DNA. Because one of the uh, real problems is, is that it actually takes quite a lot of time to collect samples and, and filter them. Uh, so some obvious solutions would be if you could put out devices that would just naturally accumulate environmental DNA in some way. So uh, this, is, this is what this rig here is, is uh, various strips of membranes and things that would naturally bind environmental DNA. But perhaps an easier way is to use organisms that are constantly filtering their environment and effectively acting like these molecular filters that we use um, uh, routinely for our work. Maybe some of these species, particularly things like sponges and barnacles and mussels and tunicates 
perhaps they would naturally accumulate this environmental DNA and we could get that signal out of them. And uh, this is work that is no longer a pipe dream. So here's some preliminary data that Hat Yarn collected uh, earlier this year. <clears throat> and what we find is that filter feeding organisms, in some instances, not all, deliver a similar sort of uh, DNA yield to what we observe from our best uh, sterile filter approaches. So there's sponges and here's our best sterile filters, uh, which in these run at about $15 a piece and these are basically free. Um, and we haven't calibrated this in any way, shape or form, but the yields look good. And then if we look at our diversity that we represent, so here's what divers see, here's what we detect out of sponges and here's what our best filtration approaches um, deliver. And I think we can optimize this quite well because we don't know what volume this represents versus what this represents. So this is filtering two liters of water. What's this represent? But we, we pick up large numbers of species from a relatively small sample of sponge. It looks really powerful. And we've got lots of ideas about how we might apply that to study the biodiversity of some of the world's most um, exotic and understudied ecosystems. Um, the last thing I just want to point out is that this point of need capability is increasingly simplifying. So at the moment, what we do is we collect these samples, we filter them, we take them back to the laboratory, laborious uh, laboratory processes that go into sequences and we, we get our answer. Uh, for some things, we would like to be able to do that at, at the point of sampling. So if you want to know if there's a marine bioinvasive present uh, in a water sample or a, at a jetty uh, anywhere around the country, wouldn't it be great if you had a simple assay that you could run there in say 15 to 15 minutes to 45 minutes and actually get a positive or a negative detection so you know it's there or present or not. Um, nanopore technology, I think, is increasingly a, a way in which we might be able to do this. And of course, there are a variety of uh, groups in New Zealand and elsewhere in the world that are increasingly using this in the field. So I think that's great. And that's an area that we are, we are also pursuing for, for many of our projects. Um, I'm going to finish, and this is a really a plug for Mike Bunce's uh, EPA project. Um, so I think it's a curious way, you know, I hope, I hope you start the, the scientific juices are flowing and you're thinking perhaps about how you might start your own hunt, how you might use this technology uh, to understand your own hour or your own moana uh, or even your own backyard. One of the things that's really neat is you could join up as a community or uh, to, into the Open Waters Project and you'd get a set of center kit for doing environmental DNA testing. Um, it's not particularly sophisticated. It's got a syringe and it's got uh, some filters and it's got some gloves um, and tells you what to do. And there's, uh, you sample your water, you send it back um, to them and they will send you the sequence results in this rather colorful looking uh, array of species that were detected in your uh, particular environment. Now, for those of us who are familiar with these technologies, you probably go, oh yeah, well, so what? That's no big deal. But imagine uh, how cool this would be for a classroom of students who have literally no idea what most of these species are. And it really starts a quite a fun investigation into finding out more about this. Uh, and it also uh, relates back to just training them into these latest technologies. So I think it's a really interesting way to connect communities back to their environment and start people getting excited about what's, uh, what's in their own backyard. I've heard some fabulous stories already about species that have been detected, including endangered species in some areas, which have completely transformed the way communities view those systems. And I think that's really powerful and quite wonderful. All right. Um, this is, I guess, a bit of a less hu than humble brag uh, in many ways. So this to me has been quite extraordinary in terms of the way I think about science and science communication. So nothing I have ever done in my career, and we've had some pretty you know, big papers that have garnered some level of interest, has uh, remotely approached this. So the Loch Ness Project generated more than 6,000 media stories across a couple of years. Uh, we've got about 150,000 social media interactions, I am told, I don't really, you'll be surprised, well, maybe not, that universities constantly monitor this stuff. I am told that we had a potential audience of 16 billion potential viewers or readers across all the 
different articles that um, went out, uh, which is, you know, obviously more people than there are on the planet. I was fortunate to be involved in a couple of feature documentaries and, the, and about four other projects. So it's been a really exciting opportunity to talk to audiences in a different way about the science. Um, if I have a dilemma now, it's what do I do next? Because I really just don't know. <laughs> so that's it in a nutshell. Um, there's probably not a lot of genomics there, but maybe it's got you thinking about how you can sell the science that you're doing in a slightly different way. Um, you can find out lots about our project uh, by looking for Loch Ness Hunters on the Wayback Machine, because um, it's all there archived. Uh, sadly, and perhaps July is the month to get this nailed, uh, the manuscript is still in preparation, much to the disgust of myself and co-authors, but mostly myself and I'll release the full data when that's submitted. Uh, that's me, and I'm very happy if there is time uh, and interest to take some questions. Thanks, Neil. I'm doing, doing the clapping for you. There we go. I'm sort of You're the a... uh, rapturous applause echoing through uh, rooms throughout the country. Uh, the cyber applause is overwhelming. <laughs> Thanks. I thought that was good clapping. Um, we are, we've only got a few seconds. Um, the, the, there is a question in the chat, which I think is the question that always comes up around eDNA is can you quantify abundance uh, of an organism in the environment? And, and Gert Jan has addressed that saying no. But I, I wondered if you wanted to comment because I think that that's, that would be a real breakthrough in this technology. Is it, so, is it looking like there are technologies that might work? So yes, I think there are. Look, it's context dependent. Um, so there are some approximations on abundance. I don't, I'm, I'm is an expert on this, so I'm not going to contradict him, but there are ways you can get around this um, that we think might work. So you can get, there are some rough correlations on abundance uh, of environmental DNA signature with uh, organism number, and people have reported that. Of course, the biggest issue is how do you compare that between something that is um, very close to where you sample, and it might be one of them, versus hundreds of them that are some distance away. So where's that? And, and I think, I actually think the population genetic approach. Uh, so increasingly, what we've been talking about here is species level detections. But when we get down into population level uh, SNP variation, it may be, uh, we may be able to then uh, apply classic population genetic approaches to work out effective population size. So it won't necessarily be abundance per se, but it may give you some ability to quantify uh, numbers that way. Very cool. I'm absolutely certain that Neil would be delighted to uh, answer questions. Uh, if you have a chance, send him an email or uh, a tweet and he will reply. I, I'm telling him now he will reply. And um, <laughs> I'd just like to thank Neil again for a fascinating uh, journey into um, the weirder end of science, but with some really uh, fantastic science communication and, and science outcomes. So thanks again, Neil, and thank you very much. As I say, if you want to go, uh, if you want to join our mailing list and you aren't there already, please send us an email and there will be another seminar in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. All right. Cure, everyone.